Hi everyone, this is Daniel Masolia from First Defense Legal Aid. Um, I'm here to introduce our esteemed presenter today, Candace Gorman, um, who from the law office of H. Candace Gorman, who, who is here to talk about, as the title suggests, what to do when, the who, what, and where, when Chicago police are hiding records from you in discovery, how to get them. Um, Candace's law firm focuses on human and civil rights. Um, she has experience um, handling pro bono habeas corpus petitions for men in Guantanamo, extensive experience trying to really get to the bottom of what Chicago police are, um, are not giving practitioners, not giving the public, not giving litigants um, during the discovery process and elsewhere. So um, with that, I just want to thank also Illinois Legal Aid Online, our, our co-sponsor of this um, this presentation and let you all know to pay attention to the chat both to ask questions if you have questions which we can um, you know address the big ones at the end and then the little ones as they come in and then also for the course evaluation and the course sign-in links um, which you'll need to do in order to get CLE credit for this so thanks everyone for attending and with that I will hand it off to Candace thank you thank you um there's also documents that uh, that are in the chat, I understand, uh, documents that I sent in for this. I'm, yeah, one of those people, <laughs> I'm one of those people that loves doing discovery. It's a, it's a weird thing, but I, I love going through these documents that I get, and I go through them ad nauseum, going through looking for any little secrets that are in there. And... Um, it's, a, it's especially challenging when you're dealing with the city of Chicago because they do not want to give you documents. Uh, when I say the city of Chicago, I'm primarily talking about the police department. And to give you an example, and it kind of segues into the inspector general's um, report on the filing system of the Chicago police department, or probably better described as the lack of a filing system for the Chicago Police Department. I want to talk about the Mason Fields case because I think that's like the prime example of what goes wrong with uh, documents from the Chicago Police. I represented a man named Mason Fields. Some of you are probably familiar with his case. Mason was, on, um, was convicted of a double murder. The murder took place in 1984. He was arrested one year later in 1985 and convicted in 1986. During the course of pretrial uh, court statuses, Nate's attorney raised the fact that he only received eight pages of the Chicago, uh, the street file. Street files were just being kind of making prominent news at that time, at the time of Nate's case, because of a case that, uh, the Jones case, Jones versus Chicago, which took place a couple of years earlier where a detective came forward in the middle of Mr. Jones' uh, criminal case and said, well, wait, he's not the one that did it. We've got files in our, about the, the real perpetrator and the testing that was done. And then of course the case ended there and that's when people learned about the street trial. Street files, are what the detectives carried around with them when they were investigating uh, a crime. And they, at the time, we found out that they considered the street files to be their personal property. So it wasn't the property of the police department or the city of Chicago. They considered it their own personal property. And so they didn't turn them over. They didn't turn over the things that they found, some of which was exculpatory, some of, some of which, um, was just, you know, required to turn over under Brady anyway. So um, Nate knew about the street files. His attorney knew about it because it had been in the news. And when they asked for the street file in discovery, they got eight pages of notes, all dated the day of the murder. This was a double murder in broad daylight down at 35th and, and State and the projects. Um, and it was, incredible, for lack of a better word, that there would only be eight pages of investigative notes and all from the same day, the day of the murder, and nothing more. And as I said, Nate was arrested a year later. So what were they saying? They only did an investigation for one day and then they just dropped it uh, until they picked up Nate a year later. Well, that was kind of what they were saying. Um, 
Nate's attorney complained about it. So we had the transcript uh, of him saying, judge, there's only eight pages and they're all dated the date of the murder. And the judge said, well, state, where's everything else? And the state said, that's all there is. And the judge looked at the defense counsel and said, that's all there is. And so Nate was convicted. He was convicted of this double murder and he was sentenced to death. Well, Nate knew he didn't do it. And Nate also thought there should be more files. And so as he sat on, on death row, he filed a lawsuit. It was not proper under the, under the laws. He filed in 1983 asking for the street file. He got uh, one of our more interesting judges for that case. Um, this was, I think this was in 88 uh, when he filed the case. Uh, he got Judge Duff and uh, Judge Duff didn't just throw his case out, although the city filed a motion to dismiss. The judge said, first, before I throw it out, because it's not the proper procedure to file this kind of case for files. Um, but first, let me ask you, city, do you have the street file? because this is a man sitting on death row. Um, and the city presented affidavits from what turned out to be later uh, the defendants in Nate's civil rights case, all saying they knew nothing. No, nothing more, there's nothing being hidden. Some of them even had wisecrack statements in their affidavit, it was pretty disgusting. So time went on, uh, because he was on death row, Nate had uh, counsel uh, trying to keep him from being executed. And um, they filed subpoenas uh, on his behalf. Over the course of the next 22 years, I counted seven subpoenas, including the one that his original attorney did at the trial. Seven subpoenas to the city of Chicago Police Department asking for the street file. And it was never turned over. Nate finally got a new trial in 2009. He was acquitted um, and he filed pro se his own civil rights lawsuit. And shortly thereafter, I and uh, some other attorneys came in to represent him. And I remember when I first met Nate, uh, I sat across from him and he, he said, Candace, I wanna get that street file. That street file is gonna prove that I never did this. And I said, Nate, that was 25 years ago that street file is long gone. You will never see that file. We'll ask for it, but it's, you know, it, we'll never see it. But, you know, I, I liked Nate and I liked his case. And so um, I agreed to represent him. And so we do discovery. Uh, we got Judge Kennelly, who was just a wonderful judge. Um, uh, we got discovery going. I asked for the street file. Took a long time to get discovery because of motion practice that was going on. But in 2011, the case was filed in 2010. In 2011, I finally got uh, discovery. And I had a law clerk working for me at the time and uh, three boxes arrived from the city, from the defense counsel. And she said she'd go through them and index them. And she came into my office a short time later and said, Candace, I think there's something you should see. And I went into her office and she pulled out these documents and she said, I think it's the street file. Oh, holy shit. <laughs> this is something I was never expecting to see. And we started going through it and there was, I want to, I can't remember the exact number now, but about 130 pages of documents, including witness statements that were never turned over, including a statement by someone who heard the perpetrators and named them. Um, or the possible perpetrators, I should say, in the stairway of the projects, talking about putting on masks and going down and shooting Fuddy. That was one of the people that was shot and killed. The notes were incredible. And it was uh, frustrating to get this for the first time 25 years later, but it was such a coup to finally get it. And of course, they started a campaign of discovery. Where was this file? Where were these documents? Why weren't they turned over? And I was collecting all the subpoenas so I could show how many attempts were made to, um, to get this file. And the city um, didn't want to answer. 
these questions. They kept going around and around. They didn't know where that file had been. So I said, well, where'd you find it? Well, they weren't really sure where they found it. Well, who found it? Well, they didn't really know who found it. I mean, it was all this obfuscation. And I, um, I went in front of the judge a couple of times uh, because they were not properly answering. Someone had to know something and they were avoiding the questions and the judge sanctioned them on a couple of occasions. Um, and finally, he told them, I, I want you to answer this question to the best of your ability. And that's when the city attorneys, the, the defense counsel, they were not the uh, corporation counsel, they were outside counsel. That's when they said, well, we think the file was in this file cabinet at 51st and Wentworth. We're not sure who found it, but that's where we think it was. Okay. So one of the first things I did when I when I discovered, actually my law clerk discovered the file in the discovery, um, was I thought I want to look at the original documents. And that's going to be one of the things I'm going to ask you to really keep in mind in these cases because it's one thing to get a copy and it's another thing to get the originals. And you want to see the whole file. You want to see the file cover itself. I mean, the, the actual um, file folder, for lack of a better, yeah, file folder. Because sometimes there's things written on those folders that you also want to see and that helps show you the whole picture of what went on. So I went and looked at it, the, the document or the folder was being held at 51st and Wentworth um, at the Lieutenant's office, the Lieutenant of Detectives. And I went over there and I went through it and I was starting to be able to put together what some of these documents were that I didn't understand. And um, for, just to give you an example, there were some notes that were like, on cut up pieces of paper that were had um, a menu on the back. And it's like, what is this about? And it turns out they were using the back of something to make their notes on. And so when they photocopied it, I got a separate, second, separate photocopy for the back and for the front. And so there were things that didn't make sense. Um, so anyway, I, I reviewed the whole file and then I uh, said to the city um, a couple of weeks later, I said, I, I wanna see the file cabinet that you claim this document was in, this file was in, the file. I want to see the cabinet. Okay, well, they wouldn't agree to that. So I had to go to the judge and I asked Judge Canelli to give, to enter an order giving me permission to go look at the file cabinet, which he did. And I went back to 51st and Wentworth, back up to the detective division, which with my co-counsel and they, a uh, detective met us up there and he took us to this file cabinet room. And just to give you a visual, I would say the room was about 15 feet wide and maybe 20, 25 feet deep. And there were a number of file cabinets in there. There was, this was 2011. So there was 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 1944 to 1985. That was all in one cabinet, 2009, 2010. I mean, it was crazy. What's this old file cabinet doing in the middle of this file, file room with all this contemporaneous stuff? And I asked the detective uh, that was uh, showing us the file cabinet. I said, how long has this been here? I don't know. Why is it here? I don't know. Okay. So I started to open the first drawer and my uh, opposing counsel pointed out I didn't have permission to look inside the file cabinet. I had permission to see the file cabinet. So back to Canelli. Um, Judge, I wanna go through the file cabinet. He's like, of course you do. So he enters an order. So don't make my mistake. If you get to go in, make sure you cover all those bases the first time. Although, in hindsight, it's probably just as well. Because I so I went back with my opposing counsel a couple weeks, maybe a month or so later, 
the detective that showed us around the first time was off. He was on furlough and the lieutenant came out, uh, met us at the elevator and took us to the file cabinet room. And he opens the door and we walk in and the file cabinet is gone. It is not there. Now it's 2005, 2006, 2007, and Savita all the way to, to the end with no crazy old file cabinet in the middle of it. And I'll say my uh, opposing counsel looked a little surprised as, as I did. Um, and he said he'd get to the bottom of it. And we, we had a status, uh, you know, the next week or so in front of Judge Canelli, and we got in and I said, Judge, I went to go through the file cabinet and it was gone. And the judge looked at uh, opposing counsel and said, uh, so what's the scoop? What's going on here? And he said, um, it seems, Judge, that they moved it to the basement because they needed the space. What? After 25 years, they finally need that one space for that one cabinet? I mean, it was ludicrous. And just as an aside, I, I did take the deposition of the detective that showed us around the first time, because um, it turns out he might have been the one who actually pulled the file. No one wanted to accept responsibility for that, um, but but it seems like he might have been, although I have my own suspicion that might actually have been a paralegal at the defense counsel's firm, but that's only my speculation. But I asked the detective, I said, you know, we went back and the file cabinet was gone. Um, when was it moved? And it was one of those times when you wished you had a video dep because this wasn't anyone important. I didn't think of ordering a video dep, but when I asked the question, he went like this right after you left. Oh man. So um, it was down in the basement and I asked the judge for permission to go down in the basement to see the cabinet and to review the cabinet and everything in it. And he gave me the permission and I went in um, a couple couple weeks later, I went with my uh, co-counsel, Melissa Matuzak, my associate at the time, Adrian Blyfus, and my daughter who was just um, preparing to start law school and was getting some on the job training. And she was also kind of a camera buff. So she brought her camera with, not expecting to see much of anything, but but anyway, we get to this, we get to 20, uh, 51st Street. We go meet with our escort, this same detective, who brings us down to the basement. We have to go through the exercise room where there's some officers working on the machines and stuff. Walk through that to this door uh, with a combination lock on it, and you know, looking all big and tough, except it was only six feet high, and then it was all space. So, you know. If someone wanted to get in there, they could. Uh, he opens it, and it's a fucking boiler room. I mean, literally, it's a boiler room. There is a furnace. There are puddles from leaking pipes, and there were 27 file cabinets. 27 file cabinets with street files. Oh, my. So we took a lot of pictures. We could only go through that one cabinet, which just bugged me because I wanted to look at some of those other ones. They were from um, area one, area two, area three, a few from area four. I don't think there were any, or if, if there was, there were just a few from area five. Um, Mr. Field's case was an area one file. Um, I got to go through that file a lot. Um, we got to go through and make a list of all of the documents in there, or of all the files in there, and um, look, we could look at them. We could look at the files. There were some that were familiar to me because of the investigation I was doing in Nate's case. There were some other uh, cases that involved the same gang, which was the El Rukins, and there were a couple of other files from other El Rukin uh, cases. Uh, so, you know, I, was, I paid a lot of attention to those and made a lot of notes. And um, that brings me to, to the Inspector General's 
uh, report because this is the problem. The problem is the city doesn't know what's there. They don't care. When we went down in that basement, no one could say what files were in any one of those file cabinets. 27 file cabinets full of files. Now, some of these files were what the police department termed open files. Open means no one was ever charged in it. Okay, so you store those. Don't you still want to have a record of where it is? But clearly, they didn't care. I would say probably, and I never figured out the um, the actual number, but I would say about 40%, maybe and not quite 50% of the files in the cabinets uh, were uh, files where someone had been charged. So um, we're looking at a whole shitload of stuff that had never been cataloged, never been uh, examined, uh, never been inventoried. And the inspector general, and, and I don't know if it's because of the publicity about the street files um, in, in Nate's case, but they, they did an investigation of the police department file system uh, that was released in 2020, it was released in June. And um, that's part of your materials. Uh, it's it's an interesting read and, um, and I did cooperate with them and I did provide as much information as I could about the problems I had getting documents. Now again, Nate had tried with seven different subpoenas over the years to get this file. I got it in a discovery request in his civil rights case 26 years later. So here's what the city of Chicago's uh, inspector general said after reviewing the police department's management and management and production of records. First, the Chicago Police Department lacks standard management-driven practices to ensure that all records responsive to a records request are produced. Well, that's kind of an important failing. And I'll tell you my feeling is that part of this failing is because of who does the management. Like the detective that was showing me around, he was in his last months before retirement. So they put him in a nice cushy job. And that's what that position had been for the years that I could tell before, because I got to take depositions. Um, it was very often a detective nearing the end of his tenure at the police department who was getting ready to retire, and he gets his last year, maybe two, um, working the files. Sometimes it was someone on a medical uh, who was who was on a medic not furlough, but medical um, had a medical condition, so he couldn't go out on the street. So in other words, this was a throwaway position. And, you know, they had very primitive uh, ways of keeping track of things. Uh, you know, piece of paper put on this person's desk who then puts it to this person's desk. So, yeah, there's no system for ensuring that everything is produced. Second thing that the uh, inspector general said was CPD's records management and production processes are inadequate to ensure the department can meet the constitutional and other legal obligations. Well, yeah, fortunately, Nate Fields wasn't executed, but you know, that was a little constitutional violation there, holding that file all those years, never giving it to his attorney, who then could have shown he had nothing. There was nothing about Nate in that file, nothing. There was a lot of stuff about a lot of other people, but nothing about Nate. So no, they can't meet their legal obligations if they don't give you what you're entitled to. What else did this uh, CPD say? They said, the, C or the inspector general said, the CPD is unable to effectively determine what records exist, making it impossible to know whether it has identified and produced all relevant records. So they have no system in place to know what's even out there for a given case. And this, the way the CPD breaks down is there's lots of different departments and different departments have their own files on the same case. And I found that again, just recently in a case that I have that uh, came from the Torture Commission. 
You ask for everything, you subpoena everything, and you don't get documents that aren't right in front of whoever's pulling it. So they'll give you the, the main file, the one that's in the, the warehouse, they'll give you that. But they don't go to forensics and pull the forensics file. They don't go to photography and pull the photographs. They don't go anywhere else. They just pull what's easy. And then, you know, it's kind of a hard back to um, Mr. Field's case, but of the, what the inspector general found was of the 15,252 subpoenas tracked within the subpoena unit's database between June of 2019 and August of 2019. So we're only talking about a three month period. 74% were never forwarded to other CPD units to retrieve related files. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is an ongoing problem. They go for the main file, maybe the one in the warehouse. And I'll give you another example of, you know, how crazy this is, and this is still Nate Field's case. So we got the street file, and there was another um, set of documents that was in the main file at the warehouse. And uh, so again, I got copies, but I wanted to look at the originals. So I made an appointment with my co-counsel to go to the warehouse and look at the file. <laughs> and we go there, you know, and I made him go sit somewhere else so I could review the file without him looking over my shoulder. And I'm sitting there going through the file. And the very, very nice man who um, is kind of the custodian of the warehouse who keeps it organized as much as it is, comes up to me, probably not realizing I wasn't from the city, and said, oh, I found this other file too that's related to this case. And I just looked at him and my opposing counsel came running up and grabbed it. And I said, well, I want to look at that one too. Um, and it turned out there were, it was like a second street file. It wasn't as damning, but it still had really interesting stuff, stuff that should have been turned over and stuff that would have been important for, for Nate's trial. So 74% um, of the subpoenas that were filled in that three month period we're not forwarded to other units. And that's still a problem. It's a problem that I encountered last year in a case in which I found out that, that documents were, I knew documents were missing, that fingerprints were an important part of this case. And um, when I kept pushing and pushing, I finally found out that, oh, well, let's check with forensics. I think it's at 13th and state or 11th and state. And let uh, let me check there. And it turns out they had their own file that had never been turned over, which had really incriminating um, documents in it, not incriminating for my client, but for the Chicago Police Department. And there were actually two files, again, instead of even one, because they put some of the documents in one file, the ones that they didn't want anyone to see, and then the other documents were in another file. And that's what they had turned over. And one of the things, when I talk about looking at the file jackets, it actually said on the jacket, it listed all the people whose fingerprints didn't match, and my client was listed on it. <laughs> so, so these are the problems. What do we do about it? Well, first, one thing one thing that was noted in the um, in the uh, inter in the inspector general's report is that uh, when you do a subpoena and you ask in general language, give me everything, broad language, you know, give me everything, they tend not to give you everything because they just give you what's easiest, which is kind of been a lot of our experience has been. They don't know what other units might be holding documents, and they don't make any attempt to. So one thing that we should be doing in our subpoenas is making sure that we list everything that we think should be out there, that we want to make sure they're looking for, and sometimes do it under separate subpoenas. I've now started doing separate FOIAs just to keep it separated. 
so that they've got to do a separate search um, for forensic evidence. Um, and you know, another one is Home and Square. You know, uh, what's being held at Home and Square? The, no one even lists. You know, they might say uh, five envelopes on the, you know on some inventory sheet. What's in these five envelopes? You know, you can go to Home and Square. You can go look at this. But be be more specific. Um, in, an, in another case that I'm handling, not the Nate Fields one, um, the one that's ongoing right now, uh, I got sanctions against the city. Uh, this time it is Corporation Counsel's Office uh, for you know not giving me things, uh, using things in their discovery that they hadn't produced to me. Um, you know it was really frustrating. And Judge Weissman, Magistrate Judge Weissman, uh, after the after Judge Gotcha had sanctioned the city either two or three times, said, and then I came with another sanction motion, said, um, we've got to get to the bottom of this. What's the problem going on here at the city? So he required as part of the sanction that, um, that the city do a list, an inventory of sorts of all the documents that come into play in a police shooting case. Then he said, I want all the documents not only within the city of Chicago that might come into play, but also third party documents. And you know, I'm not gonna hold you to the third party that you'll know every single third party, but there are certain ones that you do know that come up all the time in these cases and I want those documents. So there's two separate lists. Those are also in the materials that I submitted to you. And um, so the, the bigger document uh, list is the Chicago departments. And I'm not going to go through the documents. You can go through them, but it's kind of a, a, a starting place. This is always going to change. You know, there's going to be documents added, documents not used anymore. But this kind of gives you a roadmap as to what should be out there in broad terms. And um, we've got five pages of just Chicago Police Department documents. And again, this is organized uh, with a sh police shooting case in mind. So, you know, depending on your case, um, you might not have a lot of these documents and you might have other documents you should be looking for, but still it's a, it's a roadmap. You turn to page um, five or you can just make a note later. There's, after you get through this CPD documents, you get to the Chicago Police Board documents. And I never thought about subpoenaing or doing a request to produce the uh, Chicago Police Board, but here's a whole list of documents that they would have um, in a police shooting case. And so I think now as I as I reviewed this and thought about it, what I would do now is do separate requests to uh, separate requests for documents for each of these departments. So I would do one to the CPD and then hit all those areas, you know, including forensics and phot photography and all that stuff and um, do a second one to the um, police board. Um, and then let's see what else we have. We have the fire department. Um, and again, in a, in a shooting case, that fire department can be important. Um, OEMC and then, um, the last one was, well, actually, Office of Inspector General is on this list too. And since they've been doing all this investigation into what kind of documents are out there, they're probably a good one to subpoena for documents too. Um, and then the last ones, I'm going to come back to COPA, but the last ones are mostly where you might find camera footage. And so we've got the Depart Chicago Department of Transportation. They've got cameras, you know, Big Brother's watching everything. Department of Aviation's got cameras around. Uh, fleet and facility management, they've got cameras around. So make sure when you're looking at these cases that you try to exhaust that and make sure you're getting all the, all the documents and film footage that, that is possibly out there. I want to talk about COPA separately. So when I was doing this case, <coughs> excuse me. When I was doing this case, IPRA was the um, so-called independent body to investigate police shootings. And, <coughs> 
And that led to another um, distraction in this case that I've got because I had asked for all of the IPRA files. And what concerned me when I got what was I was told were all the IPRA files where there was no notes. And I, you know, I like notes. I want to see what people are saying at the time. And it makes sense to me that there would be notes when people are going out on the scene. They're not memorizing this stuff. So they had to write it down somewhere before they entered it into their computer. So I was talking with my opposing counsel outside of court about my frustration with getting the IPRA documents that I thought should be out there. And he said to me, well, Candace, you know, I can't actually go to IPRA. I have to go through an in-between because there's a wall up between Corporation Council and IPRA. So, um, so I have to go to my person and then they go to IPRA. And I'm sitting and I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, okay, you're the one that signs off on the discovery. You're saying you gave me everything, but you're not even talking to the person that's the agency or whatever EPRO was. And, and I left there. I didn't say anything to him. I just left there and I went to, back to the office and I drafted a subpoena to EPRO. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to get somebody who can sign off on that, that this is everything. And that led to a whole big shebang because EPRO wanted to be considered part of the city. But I explained to Judge Gottschall that the Corporation Council assistant was not in direct contact with them. And so I needed somebody. He, she ended up enforcing the subpoena. Um, so I don't know how things are working with COPA. I don't know if that needs to be its own subpoena or if um, I don't I don't have that answer because uh, I haven't had to deal with that yet. But, but keep in mind what happened to me with IPRA and keep in mind that it might make sense to subpoena them directly. So we've got all of these, these were the city agencies um, on that first list, the bigger of the two documents um, with the inventory. The other one is um, the third party list. And a lot of them are ones that you probably automatically, if, especially in a shooting case, uh, police shooting case, would be looking for Illinois State Police documents. They do most of the forensic work now. Um, medical examiner, if there was a death, um, you know, we want to get all of those state's attorney um, because sometimes there's things generated wasn't the case in mine but sometimes there's things generated by the state's attorney's office that um, relate to the evidence that was found and stuff um, I just would note that um, I'm going to get back to the state's attorney's office when I'm talking about FOIA requests but um there's a lot of things if the state's attorney's office is involved in the shooting, there are a lot of things that uh, might be in their files. And so that should be a separate subpoena. We also have um, something I have not dealt with myself, uh, the body-worn camera and taser data, taser data, taser data. Um, so I have that that's something called Axon and I have no familiarity with that. But some others, um, kind of near the, the end of this, is um, again has to do with video. Um, and for a lot of shooting cases, this could be important because even though a shooting didn't take place at a school, if it took place near a school, you know, they've got cameras everywhere. Uh, the CTA, they've got cameras uh, on buses, on trains, on um, stations. Um, the Illinois Department of Transportation, they, they also maintain video cameras on some state roads, even in the city. Um, also the FBI, sometimes the uh, police will use the FBI lab for some of the forensics. And so I don't know how you would find out if that is even an issue in your case, but uh, just keep in mind that, that they do sometimes send out uh, some of their forensics for, for review to the FBI. Um, FOP, of course, is always at the scene of police shootings, and you want to make sure you subpoena whoever you can there. Um, 
public defender files, Cook County State's Attorney files. Um, those are primarily the third party ones. And, and again, after getting these documents, these inventories in, in uh, the Young case, I, <coughs> I, I just decided in my mind's eye that I would do this a little bit different with my next case. And that's to just immediately send out subpoenas to all of those third parties. Who knows if there's something there or not, but um, if there's not, it's, all, it's okay. At least you found out. So um, the last thing I want to talk about uh, are the FOIA requests. And I, I've given you two sample ones, and I realized as I was preparing today that the sample I gave for the Chicago Police Department uh, was missing a few things that I, I think is important. Because one of the first things, you send out a FOIA, and they're like, well, we don't know who that guy is. So um, I know from that topic that you need to put in your letter that you're um, pursuing this on behalf of a client and put your client's name in there. Or at least a couple of times I've just put I'm pursuing this uh, on behalf of a client. And that's important for getting uh, compensation down the road if you have to file a lawsuit. <clears throat> but in the, in the uh, sample for this CPD, um, I neglected to put in, I, I put in my client, put in your client's name, but you should put in their date of birth um, and any identification number. Um, I forget what the number is called in the um, police department system where someone's been arrested before. They've got this number that's always the number. Put those in there just because it saves one or two responses back for you to go back and look at it. So this is obviously one of those, one of those letters that I was using where I probably had to go back later. They do want the RD number if you have it. That's the record division number. And um, that's kind of the extent of the Chicago Police Department's record keeping system. Everything is supposed to be tracked through that number. Um, it's not the best system and it's not always uh, correct, but that's, that's where they start. So in my FOIA request, um, the one to the city, um, this one was one that was specifically looking for the street file. And so I asked for, oh, and I also put in the victim's name, if, if, if you know. So this is if someone uh, is accused of a crime, your client is accused of a crime, you want to put in the date of the crime and the victim's name. That's all in this um, letter. But um, I'm asking them to construe this request as the is asking for the complete investigative file, the street file. They use both terms in there because they've got a million words for that street file and they'll play dumb. But if you say investigative file and street file, um, you should get there. Um, including all investigative documents, including police reports, general progress reports, supplemental reports, handwritten notes, and what's not in here is um, stuff that I obviously wasn't looking for in this case, uh, photographs, crime scene photographs, uh, fingerprint stuff. That's, not, that's, that's a technical term, fingerprint stuff. Um, now, if you ask for those things specifically, either in one letter or in multiple FOIA requests, then in theory, they have to go to those departments. If you just ask for the file, what we found out from the inspector general's report is what we've all uh, kind of experienced. We ask for the the file, and then it's like, oh, you wanted that too? So um, yeah, so ask for everything you can think of either in one FOIA request or in multiple FOIA requests. And um, and then you have to go through it. I mean, I told you at the beginning, this is my favorite part is reading through discovery and seeing what's there and what's not there. Uh, so when you go through whatever you get, you're trying to figure out what else, based on what's in there, is missing. So for example, sometimes you'll see um, a memo. Um, 
a GPR. They're not supposed to be using memos anymore, although in older files, you might see a memo saying, um, according to Detective Smith, uh, after his interview of John Doe, um, he went and did such and such. So, you know, you okay, so there's a Detective Smith and a John Doe who should be accounted for somewhere in here. Um, that's the kind of, you know, getting deep down into the files, but you need to do it in order to figure out what you're missing. So when, when you don't find those things, or when you see um, an, an inventory saying photographs are taken or fingerprints are taken or whatever, and there's no photographs or there's no fingerprints, you need to know, know that that's a problem. And so that's when you um, can file suit. That's when I call Matt Topic over at Lovey. And I say, you know, I think there's stuff missing. There's, you know, some, I'm looking at this um, and there's stuff that's, that I think should be in the file that are that is not in the file. And I'll, you know, I'll give you just another example of another file that I did a FOIA request on. This was again for someone at the Torture Commission, so I couldn't do a subpoena because they don't have, only the Torture Commission itself has that subpoena power. Um, so I do FOIA requests to find out as much as I can. And so I did a FOIA request for a client and I asked for everything including all the notes and you know you know i was a little bit specific probably uh, kind of like this one that i gave you as an example and i got back about 35 pages that's usually a harbor or something is wrong um, because a murder case should not have 35 pages but in the letter sending it to me they said oh and um we are withholding some documents based on investigator privilege investigator privilege ever hear of that no because it doesn't exist it doesn't exist but they were withholding documents based on that so i called my topic and i said is there an investigative pri privilege and are, can they withhold stuff i mean this is what i want what the investigator is doing and he said no they can't and he filed the lawsuit and you know it took a couple of months they asked for extensions because they had to go do some searching uh, and then I got 300 pages, and it was an important 300 pages. Because one of the other things you always want to do, and especially if you think things were withheld, is you get the state's attorney's file and you get the defense file from the earlier case, and you see what's in it. First, does the public defender's file, if, if it was the public defender or the defense counsel, do they have all of these documents that I just got part of FOIA? In this client's case, a lot of it was never turned over. But then you get the state's attorney's file, and sometimes you find the same thing. None of it was turned over to them either. Sometimes you find some of it was. Um, you know, it's kind of a crapshoot. But um, that's, you know, that's really getting into the weeds to figure out if you have grounds to file a lawsuit under FOIA to demand more. And you know, it was easy in that case because they said they were withholding stuff on a theory that doesn't exist. But sometimes it's not that easy and you're kind of trying to figure out what might be missing based on what you're seeing and what you've seen in the other files, hopefully that you have. So um, it's, it's frustrating. Well, they have, as you can see from the um, request, you can do it by email. Uh, they have technically five days to respond. They always have, ask for an extension and, you know, that's fine. You have to keep on track on top of it because um, they'll say, the, you know, they'll say they need an extra 10 days or maybe they won't say how many days they need. And then you never hear from them again. Um, so you've got to have a little tickler system to get back to them to remind them they're getting stuff to you because it really is an awful system and they really it's I, it seems to me it's the same kind of office where it's people who are just in there for some temporary period before they go back out on the street so they don't excuse me know or care so i want to talk a little bit about the um state's attorney for you because that's kind of an important one because i just i gave you a, a sample one for the state's attorney's file um, 
which is primarily what what we're looking for. We want to see what the state's attorney had. Um, and so you do, a, it's the same kind of system. It's an email system again. You email the state's attorney's office. You tell them what you want. You give them your client's name, um, the case number in this case, uh, because that's how they keep their records. Um, the, 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 the issue with the state's attorney's file is, is twofold. There, you know, I've had pretty good luck getting state's attorney's file, files from them. You know, they would draft with redact the things they're allowed to redact personal information, but you, you know, you get the bulk of the file and you can see what the state's attorney had. But um, sometimes you don't. And I'll, I'll just tell you about another case. And this is a case I had at the parole commission. And um, I was looking for the state's attorney's file because um, I was looking at my client's under, underlying case. Um, and and I, I really think that this client did not do that murder. So I wanted to look at the state's attorney's file. So I did a FOIA to the state's attorney. Um, it took them a while. They asked for a couple of extensions and then they sent me like 15 pages and said they couldn't find the whole file. I thought, well, that's odd. And it was kind of 15 random pages. Um, some of it was kind of more recent stuff. But anyway, it was just, it was, it was frustrating. So I went to my client's parole hearing down in Springfield, and the state's attorney's office uh, was represented, and they were opposing uh, his parole because 41 years for, uh, prison, for in prison wasn't enough for him. Um, and I was listening to the state's attorney when she was making her presentation, and I thought, wow, she's got a lot of detail about the crime and what you know what went on in this case and you know yet they only had 15 pages that's kind of weird uh she was a very nice attorney i went up to her during a break and i said uh, jennifer um do you have uh, mr bell's file do you have his uh the state attorney's file for him oh yes candace but it's too big i couldn't bring it with i only brought what i needed oh, okay <laughs> So that's when I found out that the state's attorney's office also doesn't have the best um, system. I'm sure, I feel pretty confident that they were not hiding this file from me. They just didn't know that they've got to go look in other places if it's not you know, in the warehouse files. They've got to go and check, is there any other reason? Is there a post-conviction matter up that maybe it's been assigned and someone's got the file? Or is there a parole uh, hearing or maybe a clemency? something where uh, the file has been pulled and it's with somebody else. So, you know, I did eventually get that file, um, but just know that there are lots of quirks out there. Um, with the state's attorney's office, there's also other things that you can ask for. And this came up on our listserv recently, and I've just had experience um, requesting a couple of these things. Um, you can ask for all of the cases. Not, so I had um, a case where my client had a post-conviction hearing that was heard by Judge Ford, at least in part. And um, totally unrelated in another case, I was in Judge Ford's courtroom. This had to do with another um, Al Rukin who was getting uh, a deal to uh, make up shit about Nathan Fields. And it was in front of Judge Ford, and he announced before he heard the matter, uh, getting the reduction in sentence for this guy, he said, um, I just want to put everyone on notice that I was involved in uh, some of the Al Rukin files. And I don't know if anyone wants me to recuse myself. I'm happy to do that. And of course, the state's attorney couldn't care less, and Mr. Badass Witness, who's lying through his teeth, couldn't care less either, and so they went ahead. But I was thinking about this other case that I'm working on, and um, 
Judge Ford heard that case. And I wondered if there was a way I could find out what cases he worked on as a state's attorney. And it turns out you can't. You can do a FOIA for the list of cases that a judge who's now a, a who was an us, assistant state's attorney is now a judge. They have a list of all their cases. I guess this kind of comes up a lot, maybe, maybe. So, um, cause I got it very quickly. And lo and behold, my client's case was on that list. So Judge Ford actually heard part of his post-conviction matters, even though he was the assistant state's attorney on that case. So I was busy preparing my you know, motion for recusal and whatever else I could do because I was so angry. But then he retired, moved on to Southern California. So know that that is something you can ask for. If you've got a judge who used to be a state's attorney and you want to just see what else he worked on or she worked on, you can ask for that. Um, you can also ask for a background on assistant state's attorneys. Their timeline, I just found this out very recently, their timeline and different positions within the state's attorney's office. So just know FOIA can be your friend and when in doubt, contact um, Matt Topic, which is what I always do. So um, I just have a few tips that I'm gonna end this with um, and then I'm going to uh, turn this over to any questions that that might be out there. But these are kind of some tips that I came up with as I was preparing. And um, some of those I've already mentioned in the course of what I was saying, but I'm gonna just mention them again because I wrote them down. And so you're gonna hear it. Um, ask, go ask for copies of the file covers themselves. And believe me, I found my client was exonerated um, in a file cover. So it's important stuff. Go and see the actual file. I actually had a case long before um, before this. I was working on a was actually an ERISA case 25 years ago, and um, there was a document that just didn't. Something just seemed weird about it. I don't know why, and I certainly can't remember now. <laughs> but I do remember going to my excuse me again. I'll say. The timing here is just about perfect because I think my voice will be totally gone by the time the hour plus is, is up. Um, I went to look at the document that I had in question and it must have been something important because I wanted to go and see the original. And it was what, there was something whited out on it. And, and I don't remember the details now. I, I just remember it, something was whited out and um, it was important and um, I believe I asked the judge for permission to uh, have it, have the whiteout taken out. It was that kind of, you know, that whiteout that's thicker than the paper. But, you know, there's there's just things you see. Sometimes things are just off the page they copy. Um, that sometimes is kind of interesting. So go and see the original documents, the actual file. Make sure you're seeing all the original documents things. And go to Home and Square. Hey, it's fun there. Um, I've been to Home and Square a few times. Want to go see what evidence is being held there? You want to maybe take pictures of it? Those you need a subpoena for. But, but when you're asking for documents, again, be as specific as you can so that they have to go to those units within the police department to actually um, see if there is anything, especially forensics and photography. Those are the ones I've dealt with. Um, so, and I'll, I will tell you, I have the hardest problem I have had is getting photographs. And it seems like photographs are kept in several different places in the police department just to make things even crazier because they've got slides and they've got um, negatives and then they have photographs and they just, they don't seem to all come together at the same place. Um, so I already said, go look at Home and Square. Again, that's something you'll need a subpoena for. Ask for, ask for crime scene sketches. Wow, that's one of those things that, um, that's really valuable because it's, and you want to see the originals of those too, because that's what people were told at the time. That it, 
as close to the incident as you're going to get when the investigators are on the scene and they draw that, that crime scene. Um, you know, I have one where there was blood all over my timer. Uh, there's one that um, had blood all over and in, in each room they put where all the blood was and stuff. I mean, the sketches were really helpful and really useful. So um, make sure you're getting those. That should be in the file. And that's held at Home and Square. They've got their own little file system there too. So make sure you ask for that and that you get it. Again, I already talked about the state attorney's file and the public defender's file are both important to see who got what back then. So you can compare it to what you're getting now or what you should be getting now. And don't be afraid to file a rule to show cause if you think something's missing. A rule to show cause is your friend and uh, go for it. So with that, my timing is perfect. My voice is almost gone. Let's uh, have some questions. Let's have some questions. Okay, am I supposed to look at chat? One, one, no, the, just a heads up um, that the screen, it's presenting your video and your screen. So I don't know if you have any like work product or something behind the browser window, just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, right now we can just see the mouse and the screen. Um, one question that came in is, what is the current status of the fields case? <laughs> Uh, we're waiting for the appellate decision. Uh, the uh, case was argued a year ago, November 8th, a year ago, Sunday. Um, so we're just waiting. Another question is, um, what percentage of the time in your experience do you end up filing a FOIA lo lawsuit over a request to the Chicago Police Department? Um, I don't file them at all. I always go to that topic. And I would say in most of the FOIA, no, I wouldn't say most. A lot of the FOIA requests I do uh, ask Matt to file a lawsuit. So um, it depends on what I get. I would say maybe 60%. Um, because again, you don't wanna just say, oh, there must be more. You really have to spend some time looking through it and figuring out what legitimately should be in there. And then there was a related question about the FOIA process, which is how often do you agree to extensions or do you ever file lawsuits based on a delay in providing any records? Um, I always allow the first couple of extensions. Um, and especially now I've got a FOIA request out there right now. And, um, and I know, you know, with the pandemic, things are a, a little bit crazier. So, um, but I always allow the first uh, couple of extensions. When they stop asking for extensions or don't have a good reason, that's when I talk to Matt and start talking about a lawsuit. So I don't always wait for the documents, but I do try to give the, the uh, police department or whoever uh, adequate time to, if they've got a good excuse. I mean, sometimes they'll come back and they'll say, you know, I was just on furlough, I started doing the search, um, I'm I'm back on it now. It's like okay, come on, let's get to it. Someone asked if you could discuss the relationship between the Freedom of Information Act and um, regular discovery, um, whether you're using them ever at the same time or um, how they. I just ask if you could discuss that. Yeah, and I I do use them at the same time. Sometimes within the Chicago Police Department, when I'm suing the city of Chicago, I will also do a FOIA request. Um, so, uh, but I also use it for a lot of outside stuff. So uh, if we're looking up information about witnesses, we might FOIA police records or um, arrest records for, for a witness that's going to be uh, um, deposed. So um, I, I do a lot of FOIA in the middle of a case. <clears throat> and I, um, and as I said, I, I have actually FOIA'd uh, the city of Chicago in the middle of a case against the city of Chicago, just because I wanted to see if I could get it any faster because they were dragging their feet.
Now I have a question um, yes. actually based on that answer. Uh, if you were to do that, um, have you, hey, let's say there's a protective order in place, um, do you or do courts in your experience treat materials obtained via FOIA um, as subject to that same protective order at the time? I haven't run into that that issue, but it's impossible for me to imagine how the FOIA request could be um, considered protected. Um, they do, you know, as, as you know, they are, or maybe people don't know, but certain information is redacted pursuant to FOIA, um, personal information, birth dates, social security numbers, that kind of thing. So those things are all redacted. And uh, so if the protective order was basically based on that kind of information, um, you know, so now I've got it in two, twofold. I've got it with the protected information that I can't share, but I have the basic information uh, from the document itself that I can share. And so, um, I, but I haven't had anyone say I couldn't use it. I mean, that it is subject to protective order. So I haven't had to litigate that. Um, um, someone just, asked, so go ahead. I was just gonna say um, in, in CRs, you know, which is, you know, litigation unto itself, uh, in CRs, um, I have gotten my own clients, the CR for my own client shooting, um, both as a protected document and as a non-protected document. So the whole file was turned over to me uh, as a public document with certain things redacted. And the thing that was interesting to me was that although they, you know, go through the, all these hoops about, oh, this is so, you know, confidential and so private, there were so few things redacted in the public version. Um, so it's worth pushing for a public version if you can, either through getting it through FOIA or else telling the city, okay, you want to keep this protected? Fine, I want a public version as well because this document is too important for my case to just have it for my eyes only. Um, there's a question about computer generated police reports. Can they be edited and reprinted? Well, yes. Um, and I'm still in the middle of uh, fighting this issue and discovering more on this issue, but uh, but I have asked for the metadata of police reports. Um, and I have found that certain reports that were tendered in a case um, had been changed. And now what I'm trying to find out is, can I get the original, um, which I don't have that answer yet. I think that I should be able to. I think that should be somewhere. I can't imagine that it's completely erased, but who knows what the city of Chicago Police Department does. So, so but I do have the proof that it was changed. That was, um, I just don't know what it looked like before. Um, there's another question related to FOIA and ongoing cases. Has a federal judge ever had an issue with your going to FOIA while a case slash discovery was occurring? No, no, and it has been known. I mean, we tender the stuff. Um, I actually have requests produced to me, I think in, in most cases saying turn over everything you get in FOIA. So with that in mind, I turn it over and I've never had anyone bring it up to the judge as something improper. Um, someone asked, what is the name of the document that shows a change has been made to the police report? I asked for the metadata and I got a printout from the police department that showed the, and I don't know the, the name of the document. I actually know where it is and I could probably go over to my file cabinet right there, but I don't want to do that in the middle of this. Um, it was a computer generated form which showed the name of the document, um, the date it was originally maintained, and the date it was changed, and who changed it, who um, who downloaded and uh, made the change. Um, that is all the questions we have at this point. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, drop them in soon or forever hold your peace. Um, there's also some thank yous and saying the presentation was very much appreciated and helpful. So I thought I'd pass that along as well. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, 
uh, someone's asking about just uh, if you could talk more about metadata and then, for example, signatures on police reports. Um, is there anything that you have to add on that particular topic? Well, the the, <clears throat> the metadata issue. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't even think about that for preparing for today. So I would have to pull the document. But I um, was, I was suspicious about some documents that um, were dated much later than I thought they should have been in in the file. Uh, Police, do, police department documents. And and I wondered, you know, were there earlier versions and, you know, what's going on here? And so I asked for the metadata, metadata and I found out that it does exist for certain documents, um, SUP reports, you can get the metadata for, um, GPRs, maybe not, although I think the jury's still out in that one, I don't know, because uh, they, they say handwritten documents, they don't keep metadata, but since they go into the computer system, it, you know, being as a copy, it seems to me that you should still be able to see if it's been pulled out. Um, but it seemed like supplemental reports uh, was a big one. And the ones that I was, that was not what originally caught my eye in this case, but because the supplemental reports followed these late dated reports, it kind of made sense to me when I saw it that yeah something something fishy's going on, um, and I'm and I as I said I'm still in the middle of this, um, trying to get information, so that I can figure out exactly what was going on. I'm sorry, was there a different a second part to that question? No, I don't I don't think so, um, and I don't know that we have any more questions. Just more thank yous. Um, I'm gonna put every. I'm gonna put the uh, attendance form and the course evaluation in the chat for everybody. And um, if you want CLE credit for this um, talk, make sure to to fill those out because otherwise we won't have your ARDC number or um, the other stuff that we need in order to do that. Um, I will give it just another minute or so, maybe for questions. And then um, if Candace has any closing remarks, love to hear them. Otherwise, um, everybody can just make sure to copy those links because the chat will disappear when we end the, the presentation. Um, um, and yeah, there's no more questions have come in. Anything you wanna uh, take us home with or should we just go our, go our separate ways? Well, I was a big fan of Elizabeth Warren um, when she was running for president this last year, although I'm just as happy uh, with the way things are right now. But she was famous for saying persevering and uh, I have a button that says persevere 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 that's my motto with this discovery stuff you've got to keep your eye on the ball and you've got to keep after them because they won't give it to you unless you fight for it and unless it just like the fields file unless it just happens to drop this judge Canelli said what did it just drop through the transit no one knows where it came from but um, so just don't give up when they um, drag their feet and don't want to give it to you. Fight for it. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, and hope everybody has a good rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Uh, also, by the way, there will be a recording of this. If you guys want to watch it again, uh, it'll be uploaded later to YouTube. So. Stay tuned for that, but like everyone said, thank you for attending and have a great day, guys. Man, I'm gonna be on YouTube. <laughs> You're famous. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.